Coming up, last week's video about Brexit coverage on the TV channel France 24 was one of my most watched videos to date and thanks to all of those who commented on it. I'll certainly follow the suggestions I received from many of you to watch the English language version of France 24 and also the German channel Deutsche Welle. Expect future videos summarizing coverage of Brexit and British politics from a foreign point of view. And this week, you could almost say that I'm looking at Britain again from a foreign point of view. But this time, it's even tougher than using my intermediate French. This week, I went through the torture of interpreting coverage in the Daily Mail. Disgusting language that to me is more foreign than anything served up by Franz van Kartra. This is the headline that attracted my attention. Shocking rise of something for nothing Britain. I read the article so you don't have to. And surprise, surprise, the story is based on a report from a shady think tank based at 55 Tufton Street and is an obscene manipulation of the facts about Tory Britain in 2023. So stay tuned. <laughs> If you enjoy watching the Truth to Power channel, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help me out by hitting the like button and especially by sharing a link to this video on your social media platforms. The Daily Mail article claimed that, for the first time, more than half of households, 36 million people, get more from the government than they pay in tax, according to a study by Civitas. Civitas are one of those shady Tufton Street outfits whose funding sources are opaque. They describe themselves as an institute for the study of civil society. And a look at their website reveals, amongst other things, their pride in a recent report that they've published, which they describe as a knowledge-rich primary school curriculum designed to enable children of all abilities to share in the intellectual heritage of Western civilization. Their aims to get involved in primary education seem to me quite disturbing, with statements like, We have published a knowledge-rich curriculum that will allow schools to bring out the best in every pupil from every background, prepare children for public responsibilities, and encourage social cohesion by emphasising our common heritage. The common heritage they refer to appears to be the heritage of Western civilization. This seems to me to be the language of the far right, emphasising the othering of British citizens with a different heritage, in a vaguely fascistic fashion. Transparify gave Civitas a highly opaque zero-star rating this year, as its funding information is completely out of date. They're associated with John Constable, who is now on the academic advisory board of climate science-denying think tank, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, the GWPF. And Civitas started its life as part of the Institute of Economic Affairs, the IEA, promoting libertarian free market ideas as most recently implemented in the Trust Kwarteng fiscal event. So let's see what they had to say in their report that led to the Daily Mail spunking forth this article about something for nothing Britain. A brief glance at the report shows why the Daily Mail claims more than half of households get more in benefits than they pay in tax. This is because the Civitas report says they get the most benefits in kind, in which they include the NHS and education. Their figures come from the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, whose figures show that the poorest fifth of people don't get as much in some benefits in kind as the very richest. For example, the poorest fifth in society get the most from state education because the richest are more likely to pay for private education for their offspring. Likewise, although almost everybody gets similar benefits in terms of the NHS, the very richest again get less, probably because they're more likely to elect to pay for private health care. But rich people benefit disproportionately from things like subsidised rail travel. The Daily Mail article also states that Civitas alleges that the richest people are also bearing the cost of the nation's massive reliance on the state. This is absolute bollocks. We do have a progressive income tax system where the highest earners pay a higher marginal rate of income tax. But that's not completely true of national insurance, for example, which hits the less well-off disproportionately. And also the indirect taxes like VAT, where the poorest fifth of people 
pay vastly more than the richest, with effective tax rates of 19.49% for the poorest versus 6.35% for the richest. Also, the Civitas report admits that the effective direct tax rate for council tax is highest for the poorest people as shown in this diagram, while the richest pay the least as a proportion of their gross income. So what the Daily Mail claims is a shocking rise in something for nothing Britain isn't anywhere near as straightforward as it would have us believe. They quote the odious former work and pensions secretary Ian Duncan Smith as saying, lockdown changed the psyche of the British people. For all those years, we told them you can't get something for nothing. And then all of a sudden they did. IDS, who has caused a lot more suffering in his lifetime than the similarly named IBS, is not alone amongst Tory MPs in demanding tax cuts for the rich. And the Civitas report points out that 53% of income tax is indeed paid by the top 10%. That may not sound fair to the expat offshore proprietor of the Daily Mail, but this is exactly how a progressive or redistributive tax system is supposed to work. Gabby Hinsliff, writing in The Guardian recently, made the point that the idea that rich people pay more tax than poor people is a feature, not a bug, possibly because the alternative, squeezing the poor until the pipsqueak while letting millionaires happily run free, has had an unfortunate tendency to end in revolutions where it has been tried. So of course the richest should pay the most tax. But the thrust of the Daily Mail article is not about where the money comes from, but where it's going. Britons are more dependent on the state than ever before, they thunder. So who are these Britons of whom they speak? Well, I don't think I need my social sciences degree to figure out that this is probably just an inescapable consequence of having an ageing population, a falling birth rate, restricted immigration and a post-Brexit brain drain. Far fewer people are of working age and paying taxes, at the same time that the country is facing spiralling costs of healthcare for an ageing population, alongside a massively increasing bill for state retirement pensions. Pensions are the single biggest item of welfare spending. So when the likes of Suella Braverman talk about all these lazy welfare recipients who choose not to work, she is attacking the core Tory base, perfectly healthy pensioners enjoying an active retirement, prioritising their quality of life over earning extra money by working harder, which, to be honest, seems a perfectly reasonable decision to me. And of course, the NHS is the biggest ticket item on the government's shopping list, and typically we use the NHS most heavily in the first and last years of life. This demographic shift in the age of the population is inevitably going to see costs shooting up. The whole point of the NHS, and of pensions, and the welfare state as a whole, is to be a safety net, to smooth out costs over our human life cycle, so that people who who have paid their dues can benefit from state support when they need it, living out their last years in dignity and being cared for in a compassionate manner. The Civitas report suggests that while the poorest working age households have of course always been net beneficiaries of the system, now the middle quintile is too, the averagely well-off 20% in the middle. Now a quick question. Have that middle 20% somehow conned their way into getting more generous public services than a generation that could still actually get a GP appointment? Despite experiencing 13 years of Tory austerity and seeing public services breaking around us? Or is it, rather, that something has gone very wrong for these middle earners? Years of sluggish growth before Brexit, followed by the economic self-harm and plunging trade figures post-Brexit, which have all helped to push Britain's GDP per capita below that of France and Germany. Living standards in Slovenia for the median 20th percentile family are now higher than their British equivalent. The median Polish family is expected to surpass their British equivalent in the next year or so. 
to look at those figures and conclude that somehow life is just too cushy for too many people in Britain has to be indicative of someone either too rich and out of touch to care or someone who has been reading Daily Mail articles like this one for far too long. I'm often accused in the comments section on this channel by the people in Idiot's Corner that I'm a traitor because I talk the country down. I should apparently believe more in Brexit, believe more in this corrupt government. What the Idiot's Corner fraternity don't realise is that I'm actually talking the country up. It's just the government I'm talking down because the truth is, the fact that we've had this appalling Tory government since 2010 means that when we eventually kick out this incompetent, uncaring government, Britain has the capacity to bounce back. It just needs a party in power that is looking after the interests of the population and not protecting the interest of the richest 1% and the corporations. Apart from Brexit, which will one day in the future be undone, if not in my lifetime, Britain doesn't have to be in terminal decline. We still have incredible resources in the fields of science and technology. Even in the arts, a sector much maligned by the right wing and particularly by the Tory government since 2010. Or the TV and film industry, theatre, music and even the English language. It all still gives Britain a phenomenal amount of soft power globally. But only if we're more realistic about our trading power our economic power, which is a shadow of what it was before Brexit and before the devastating austerity policies of Cameron and now Sunak. I would say to the Daily Mail, the British people don't expect something for nothing. It's just that after 13 years of Tory misrule and hammering the poor, many of them are literally struggling to survive in this toxic society where power has been transferred from the workers to the shareholders where employment has moved from traditionally secure and well-paid jobs to a gig economy, where public services are scavenged and hollowed out by profit-seeking private sector parasites, and where the welfare state has been cut, cut and cut again, with universal credit the torture weapon of choice, and state pensions being a fraction of the size of comparable economies within Europe.